Edward Norton is here. After years of stage work in New York, he burst onto the screen in 1996 with three award-winning films, Primal Fear, Everyone Says I Love You, and The People vs. Larry Flint. His new film, American History X, opens today, an examination of the roots of prejudice it promised to be one of this year's most controversial films. Here is the trailer from that film. Pleased to have Edward Norton on this program for a conversation not only about this film, but some extraordinary work that he has done. Uh, let me begin with this film. Uh, it is controversial. People are talking about it. What is it you hope that you are able to do in terms not only of your performance, but uh, that you hope this film accomplishes? Well, uh, I think when you set out to do something like this, it's, you know, there's different kinds of entertainments or there's different roles film can play. And obviously some are entertainments or, or escapist fair um, and and this is more in the realm of I think a, a, a provocation almost or the intent of it is to at best to try to just provoke some thoughtful consideration of some of the the real complexities behind these these um, tragic things that we see only I think in a little bit oversimplified sort of fashion in the nightly news I feel like the message at the end of it is is a very firm statement of the tragedy um, in all directions of of letting your life be consumed by hate, by hate and the, and rage that's behind it, and um, and so so I hope it's provocative, but I don't I, if I don't think it's controversial in the sense that I I would find it hard to believe that anyone could come away from it offended by what it concludes. Um, I'm sure they don't. I mean, let me yeah. just tell the audience it's a story of uh, it's a story of a character played by you um, uh, whose father uh, is fireman. Um, dies and early, uh, and it raises the issues of a young man uh, who, who somehow becomes caught up with skinheads uh, and is charismatic and intelligent, uh, and then uh, commits murder, goes to prison, uh, goes through certain kinds of transformation, and it reflects all of that aspect. And it also has the extraordinary um, conversation or extraordinary. Uh, dealing with the subject of a relationship within families too, right. and what it does to families. Yeah, uh, and you also see, and you <clears throat> see the, the other side of it. People tend to, I suspect, when they talk about a controversial subject, which this clearly is. Yes, you know, because of the violence that comes out of it, because of the rage that's there, and because of the hate that is in these groups. You know, if you deal with controversy, someone says it's a controversial film, right. which is not true. And let me talk a little bit about your preparation and, and how you approach this. To take a character, you know, who starts here and goes here and then comes back to somewhere else mm -hmm. as a result of an experience in prison. Well, I think that um, I think that you know uh, that's the that's the challenge of a role like that, or the appeal of sure. it for for me is is not even so much just the one very extreme manifestation of this guy, but more the emotional distance that he travels. That's, um, I mean, it's obviously a challenge on a certain level just to, just to represent him in that really horrific sort of skinhead mode that he's in. But almost the deeper challenge is to, is to take him from that all the way to, a, to the point where, you know, after two hours an audience has been forced to contend with the the real human complexity of him and and maybe even have a certain empathy for him as a character and uh, uh, you know there's there's different I mean you find your way into a role on all different levels or in different ways and in this case um, you know the start of it for me was almost just just taking on the physical this physical transformation, yeah, because a, a strong physique. I think we, we all felt that like um, he needs to be in the tradition of of good tragic drama. I think he needs to be a larger than life character. He he needs to be. He is seen very clearly in the memories of his brother as this almost iconic figure of 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 heroic stature in his brother's mind, and and I think that we all agreed that. Um, we needed to manifest that, manifest this sort of larger than life feeling to him, and and so it was, in, for me right off the bat, it was I'm I'm not, I'm not that size, <laughs> I, I, so I, I like I needed to, uh, I needed to take that on, and and I you know so I, and and in doing that you start 
to find your way into other things because once you um, put your body into the kind of shape, I mean, it informs the way he feels about himself. And then you start to look at the, the iconography these people put all over their bodies yeah. and the tattoos. The Nazi signs. Yeah, and, all and that. you start to get inside what their relationship to those things and how the, those things are empowering to them. Um, and, and all of that starts to lead you into the why of um, what makes a young American man in this day and age uh, in our culture right now um, move toward this or what are the what are the complex you know environmental and emotional dynamics that that push a person toward those choices because because on a lot of levels I think as much as the the message of the end the, on a lot of you know a lot of people seeing this I mean you me a lot of other people are kind of the converted as yeah, exactly. far as convincing people that racism is a bad thing or that racism ha and violence have consequences. A lot of people know that already, but, but those of us who do, I think, do another thing that's perhaps um, sort of a bit of a denial, which is we look at events like Matthew Shepard getting tied to the fence posts or this guy being dragged in Texas, and, and we this have a, a young gay man that was beaten to death. Right, and we, there are you know, things in the news all too frequently, and we have a tendency to to look at the people who commit the act and it's easier to just you know call them evil or uh, treat it like it's an aberration but the truth is it's not and there's a there's a very tragic and complex human dynamic that flows backwards in their story as well and i think confronting an audience to take on the more disturbing task of of dealing with the real complexity of what created that person is tough too who they are and what it is that yeah, makes them right, attracted exactly. to this kind of ideology yeah, yeah. exactly uh, let me take a look at a clip just to give a sense of what you look like and, and, and who this character is. Roll tape. American History X. Here it is. The person they're holding back is, in this case, Derek Vineyard's brother, who's a who, younger brother who is heroic in his worship, or who wor has a heroic worship of his older brother. What is it you think attracts people to this kind of sort of skinhead, uh, Nazi-loving uh, celebration of violence? Well, uh, I mean, I, I should be careful because I, I am an actor, not a sociologist. But and, and this is but only you thought about it more than yeah, most people. Yeah, of course, and, and of course, yourself. I mean, the job for for me in this case was to try to understand some of those motivations. Right. And um, I, you know, my my experience, and it's only my experience, is that uh, the truth is that a lot of, I mean, the Derek Vineyards in that world are very rare people with that sophisticated a sense of the specific politics. Um, a lot of times you run into kids who literally, I, I, was, I was looking for um, what some of these tattoos meant. Some of them are things like Viking runes and Celtic yeah. crosses. And literally there's kids who have them on their arms and they don't know what they mean. And, and I think that's emblematic of a certain reality, which is that a lot of these kids enter into that not out of any deep self-generated sense of identification with fascism or or Hitler or Nazi politics or racism even or anything they just are in such totally blighted yeah. environments and circumstances and family lives that they they move into the gang out of a need for a sense of belonging a need for a sense of participation in something bigger sense of family and, and a sense of alternative family right. but no different than a than a black kid in Inglewood who joins the Crips right. you know not um, and and uh, and that's that's interesting because you begin to realize that that even even in acknowledging that you're acknowledging that there's kind of a very poignant human sort of tragedy behind behind why a lot of the I mean these are social dynamics that are pushing these kids toward this not not sort of a bad seed impulse yeah. to go toward something evil and and and, and and then beyond that um, you know, you you have you have people who have suffered kind of things like this kid has, and he makes the unfortunate choice of of needing something to direct the anger outward at, and and you know it takes the form that rage takes the form of hate. Did you want to? I mean, I read something somewhere that said you you wanted to, in a sense, make the character Derek Vineyard intellectually smarter than he was. In other words, you felt it was important to do what about his, who he was? Well, uh, it was it was always a function, uh, you know, kind of an element of David McKenna's original script that he was an intelligent character, um, that he was an intel intelligent person because it was always an element of David's, I think the tragedy that was built into David's script that, that this is a kid who at the end has wasted an enormous amount of potential. Um, and I think 
when I came in to start working on it with David and stuff, we, we decided to beef it up even further because I think um, we just all felt that the more on some levels uh, elevated his intelligence, charisma, leadership capacities, um, care for his family, all these things, these, those qualities of him enhance, I think, the dramatic impact of the end in which you know, the, when the consequences of his initial choices come back to get him or come back to find him, it, it's, you have a stronger sense of the waste or of the loss of the, um, that this guy represents. Um, in some ways, uh, I don't know how to say it, for the same, not to equate it, this on any level with these grand tragedies like Othello or something, but there's a reason that Othello is the great general and not a foot soldier. Exactly. It, 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 it augments or it enhances the impact of of what we feel for his fall, right, right. and so and so, no less so, Derek. I mean, this is a contemporary American story, but in Derek, you know, I think we tried to create a character who whose dimensions come out of that tragic hero tradition. Right. Let me take a look before we get too far to another clip here. This is uh, shows you some sense of the kinds of, uh, of action that is taking place here. This is after Derek goes to prison uh, for three years for convicted of manslaughter, I guess. Or, right. right. Yeah. He, he's there's a certain element of self-defense to what he does, so he's convicted to um, seven years. Right. In, and, in and here he is, and this is a, he's visited by a high school teacher uh, who plays a role in his life. Take a look at this. All the characters. Tell me this. We were just talking as we were watching this. You said one of the things you liked about the moment was... Yeah, well, to me, to me that's kind of always been one of the key scenes in the movie, and uh, I love what Avery Brooks did in there because he... I think he, he brought to that moment... Um, for that character, even a complexity, he he reveals a certain complexity there. That's a character who's, on a lot of levels, he's been almost sometimes annoyingly self-righteous in his moralizing to these kids. Yeah, exactly. And 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 Derek, in a way, calls him on it in that yeah. moment. Says, "What do you know about me?" And it's not until that moment that even this teacher Sweeney backs off and admits that, for himself, it's been a process too. And and suddenly you get this vision of him. I think as probably an ex-panther or someone who was himself very consumed by by anger that he directed outward at right, white right. people in society and God, as he says, and, 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 and it's only when he sort of opens up himself that he sort of starts to penetrate this kid. Uh, and, uh, and then he asks what I think is, for me, really the key question of the movie or the key turning point when he says, is any of, these, is any of this that you're doing making your life better? And, and once he answers no, it, it's like that's, I think, where the dam begins to break in him. James Rouse was your grandfather. Yes. Who appeared on this program, a man who, of, of, uh, who deceased, but of a great uh, talent and creativity, uh, who showed what we can do with inner cities, and those landmarks are all over the place in Boston and Fannell Hall, Waterside and Norfolk and in Baltimore, Baltimore yeah. and, and uh, did he, is he responsible for Columbia too? Or was yeah, that, yeah, Columbia, so, Maryland. Which is where you grew up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when did this thing about acting come to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, there's... I mean, why not architecture, Edward? Well, <laughs> um, why you know, not he, uh, city planning? Uh, right, right. <laughs> why not something rather than somebody who goes to Yale, studies Japanese and sort of becomes enamored of, of what... It, an actor's life could be. Yeah, I actually, um, I mean, I kind of caught the bug when I was very young, when I was about five or six years old, and uh, and I started, I started actually taking acting classes when I was about five or six, and did it. Uh, it's five been five or six. Yeah, yeah, it's been a, it's been a true lifelong pursuit, although not fully embraced as a, um, I guess what I would call a life pursuit or in a professional pursuit as an adult mm -hmm. until I was. You know, a couple of years out of college, maybe, but the, um, but uh, but it was something I've always done and always been very compelled by. And so there's no question when you went to Yale, you knew you were going to be an actor. Mm, I knew that one of the reasons I wanted to go there was that there was a very fervent drama school, th right. theater and yeah. environment there. Um, but I don't know that I knew or had accepted. Uh, I guess I, I hadn't come to grips completely completely at that point with the idea that, that I was going to choose that over other things because I was very interested in a lot of things. But as you get older, and we all know, you, there, you find yourself, you can't do everything. And, and the, as the, cho the choices start to reach a point where 
I, I was letting other opportunities go to not give the, the up the opportunity to, to keep acting. And so at a certain point, you say to yourself, um, this, this must be what I really want to do because I can't imagine um, leaving it for any other opportunity. And, 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 and then at that point, sort of embrace it almost spiritually. But the... Um, what but was my, it? But what, my granddad, my granddad. Um, <laughs> see, I mean, there's no, there's no show business people in my family, but there's a lot of artists. Two of his, yeah. two of his sons, my uncles. One's a painter and one's a musician. And yeah. um, my grandfather was enormous, and my parents are, are enormous supporters of and lovers of the arts. They're the kind of people who keep us all in business because they, they're avid <laughs> attenders. Yeah. Um, and so, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of support for it, even though there was not. Um, sort of a tradition of actually doing it. <laughs> what do you think it is about acting that is such, brings such whatever it does for you? Uh, I, mean, what I don't is know. It that, I, what is it that draws you to it is my question. I, I would say on some level it's a, um, I've always had a compulsion toward, uh, toward mimicry on some level. My, I mean, since I was very, very small. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I think um, that the the you know the most essential quality of an actor is an is an empathetic quality. It's the it's the ability or an instinct toward looking at other people and the the gestural ways that they communicate um, and and soaking that up and having an instinct for soaking that up and, and representing it. And that's the natural quality about an actor. I mean, that, if, if there's some natural gift, that's what an actor has. Yeah, the capacity it's, it's, it's kind to do of that a, going in. Yeah, know? it's kind of, kind of a radar for human behavior or it's yeah. a, um, in, at least an interest in it. And I, I've always found, I've, on another level for me, I've always found, uh, because I always did have a difficult time um, with the idea of making choices that would limit my experience um, or choosing <laughs> lifestyles that on some <laughs> level right. put me in a track. No, just... Being an actor, being an actor you know, on an adult level for me, it's like you get to be an experiential dilettante. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you, can, you get to dip very substantially into these worlds of experience, um, even modes of being and expression that, uh, and, and really root around them for a while, get the thrill of it, get the taste of it, and then step out without any of the consequences of actually choosing that as a lifestyle. And, and, and go on to something else. And go on yeah. to something else. Yeah. And I, I find for just uh, that is for me an incredibly, that's a, that's a, um, that's, that's not even a job for me. I mean, that's just, that's the work that's not work. I, I, I really, really enjoy that sort of diversity of experience. And, um, and then on a, <clears throat> On a broader level, I, I still I do have a fundamental faith in or um, passion for just the the broader art of storytelling. Back to mimicry, um, has Woody Allen seen you do <laughs> Woody Allen? Yeah, after a while of working with him, <laughs> yeah. I finally kind of uh, I finally got up the stones to sort of do it for him straight, and you know he kind of you know, he was like, yeah, that's very good, you know. <laughs> Don't, just give me about thirty <laughs> seconds more. I can't. I can't. It's too. It's too. But he. He. Um, he's so. I mean, he's so. He is so distinctive. Like it's. I mean, people, I talked to Kenneth Branagh one time, um, not too long ago, about he'd just done this film Celebrity, Celebrity with um, right. with him, and and he's and and we were talking, and we were sort of admitting, you know, and it's not something people don't comment on. It's like. If you're the person sort of playing the role that probably he would have played, yeah. it, it becomes almost impossible to be around <laughs> him and not in some ways become his proxy. <laughs> yes. You, you, so you've you got just, to be what you, in, yeah, part you, in the role. You just find, you find yourself taking on his cadences and rhythms. Like it's, and at a certain point, you just have to surrender to it, like, <laughs> I think, because it's... it's uh, what was it like? Mean, what did he teach you? What did he get from... Well, he's a... Uh, um, He's he's a very well, what you learned, I guess, than what he taught. Well, you learn things. You learn things from every director um, because they all have different styles. Uh, you know, he has. I, I don't know. I mean, one. These, some things get very technical, but he still. Um, I think he has for a long time. But he he tends to film things in a way that um, he doesn't shoot a lot of coverage. In other words, he doesn't do these over the shoulder, over the shoulders. He tends to film things in in long what they call master shots, and you end up doing things in a much more, the it's more theatrical right. because you, you play scenes out Long in real time. Long master shots rather than a lot of cutting. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, 
And, and interesting things come out of that. You realize you get a certain a kind of a spontaneity out of people that's, um, which is what he's one of the things he's famous for. I think that feeling of real extemporaneous dialogue and interaction. And um, I, th I think his work ethic is in, is intimidating too. I, uh, you know, to make a film a year is a, is a kind of an amazing thing. Um, mm. And to be finishing one while writing another and going on and on, it's um, it's a it's a. But everybody wants to work with him. Yeah, yeah, it's... I know of no one that wouldn't... Well, because he, you know, there are only... He, he's one of the few true auteurs, I think, and in the best sense of the word, in that he, he follows a very personal muse, and you, you... As an actor, it's always thrilling to work with anybody who's got a real clarity of vision, um, because it frees you on a lot of levels to just serve someone else's, to play a role in a... You, you know that the world you're going to be creating is going to be very distinct because it's coming out of that person's um, you know very unique mindset and and I, and I don't know why I mean I'm just a fan of his films I'd you know I'd do one anytime really how do you see that whole sort of notion of, of, of how you're going to handle all of this because the kind of talk about you for this film this role which you I think have thinks is the best thing you've ever done I assume well I'm, very, I'm as proud of it as anything yeah, I've done right. it's a, um, I mean, everything has different satisfactions, right. and this this is a certain kind of them. But it's certainly a it's certainly a character with a a, a, a you know a very challenging scope. So I felt because I felt of all the range that we talked yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt good about it. It's a it's a definitely any any anything you enter into with a certain fear quotient. Anything yeah, you that right. that's always a pretty good sign to me that it's a good thing to be chasing because it means that you're going to be pushed. If if you're a little bit afraid uh, that you're not going to be able to pull it off. Um, that's a that's a that's probably means it's going to be a challenge that's going to be rewarding um, if you do. And what would you worry about in a whether it's primal fear, Larry Flint, which is a, one, a different, totally different kind of thing, playing the attorney in that or in this? What is it when you create a character? And I'll end with this: that you worry about not being able to be what? I mean, you um, know you're a good actor, and so you know you can deliver. But it seems to me that if you look at the performance. You're looking to, to make these people memorable. Well, yeah, that's, but that's it. That's very, for me, that's very much it. The actors that I appreciate the work they do the most are the ones who create characters that are so distinct yeah. from the person themselves or any knowledge I have of the actor and their persona that the, that the character lives on independently in my head or, and I think in the collective unconscious. You know, they, they, they take on this life of their own. Like, I mean... A Razzo Rizzo or a right. Travis Bickle or, you know, Hannibal Lecter, any great character that really, you know, takes on a life of its own. And, and so for me, you ask that question, my, my answer is I become nervous if I feel I'm not going to be able to make it something dis very distinctly different from myself. And let me just, just follow up on that. So do, what do you need and do you know when you get it? Do you know when you've locked it? Do you know when, you know... I'm inside this guy's head. I can deliver on making this person whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, I mean, it's always a <laughs> film is on is by its nature a very fragmented right. and and repetitive process over a long done over a long period of time. So you're never completely certain in the way that, for instance, in a play when you're out there performing on a given evening, you can feel it. Uh, you get a feedback, and, and you're doing the whole piece, so you can feel if the piece is working. In a in a film. It's a it's a it's a bit more of a crapshoot in the sense that you're you're trying to sustain to piece the puzzle together in your head as you go. What pieces have I done so far, and is it holding together? But I do think even even then, if you've done your homework and if you've really spent the time, you you can feel a certain point when you click over into a zone with a character where you you hit a point where I think where literally if something happened that was not in the script or unexpected, you'd respond out of that place and not out of your own head and that's when I think for me I know um, I'm, I'm, I'm down in that skin if if the, You're in the zone you want to be yeah, in. Yeah. yeah. It's great to have you on the program. I Thanks hope you'll come back. Much. It really not is. Not at all. Thanks Thank for the you. time. Edward Norton, the film is called American History X. Back in a moment. Stay with us. <laughs>